100 years ago, we used 20% uh, of our land base for fuel, and that was to feed the horses. And today, we still can use 20% of our land base for fuel, and, but that's making biodiesel. So it's kind of ironic that the same percentages hold true today as they did over 100 years ago. Bringing the people behind our food to life. We bought this farm, my wife and I did, in 1983. We were dairy farmers my whole life. I sold the dairy cow six years ago because of uh, physical issues, you know, milking cows for 40 years. My knees were pretty well had it, and I've always kind of dabbled in research a little bit. I did it with the dairy cows. I've always been a little kind of anal with numbers. I like keeping track of stuff, and the University of Vermont Extension asked if I'd be interested in growing some canola just to see if, uh, uh, if it was something we could grow here in, in Vermont. Heather Darby is the agronomist that got the grant to do the oil studies. And what we're studying is more, you know, what the requirements are to be able to grow these different crops here. So that's where that's, the SARE's really played a big role in funding this so that we could uh, get those results so we can pass those on to farmers. To be perfectly honest, when I started doing this six years ago, my goal was, well, let's grow this canola and we'll have our own canola meal and, and we'll get some oil out of it. Well, it turns the other way around. I mean, it's, we're using the oil as our main ingredient uh, for growing the crop and then the, the meal is a byproduct. So we, we feed all the canola meal and sunflower meal to the cows because it's a real high protein and it fits real good in the ration. And then the, the stock that's left in the field, with the canola especially, we use that as a bedding source for the cows. So that adds another value. So all those uh, considered, that's why this on-farm biodiesel production is so successful here. Canola and sunflowers are the right crop for this region. I mean, it works. We're still doing some research on, you know, the, the ideal variety that does well here. Canola, we know that is the, the highest yielder as far as oil per uh, acre grown. Uh, sunflowers is a close second. We're leaning more towards sunflowers. Number one, I think, is that it, they're pretty <laughs> when they're growing. I mean, the neighbors love it because the fields are so yellow and bright and, you know, you get gloomy days, people feel uplifted. Well, maybe psychologically there's a reason to do things. Uh, for us, it seems to be they're a little easier to harvest than the canola. I'm not saying canola is, is, not, is out of the question because we're still doing some canola. We've tried a little bit of soybean, but the yields are so low that it really doesn't, uh, doesn't fit for us. So we're basically concentrating more on the sunflowers and canola. And then the next step is uh, making sure the timing is right when we harvest it so that the plant is at the right stage of harvest. The biggest problem with for us to mow canola down into a swath like they do in the Dakotas is we get a lot of rain. And what we found is when we did swath that the rain uh, rotted the plant when it was all mowed down. And uh, we, were, we were unable to harvest it because it was so wet. So we found that just letting it stand ripening uh, on the stalk standing work better, but we have to time it right so that when the crop is ready to harvest, we have to be out there because we'll have a lot of field loss because those seed pods on canola shatter real easily. So it's a timing thing more with the canola than it is an equipment thing. There's a little difference in uh, uh, harvesting sunflowers here because we don't have any equipment designed to do that. I mean, it's a, it's a regular combine that we use to harvest it grain, any kind of grains, corn or whatever. We put in like sunflower fingers, it's sunflower pans is what they call for combines they use out in the Midwest to do thousands of acres. Well, on these old machines, I mean, it, if I could find somebody to make a set of these sunflower fingers, it would probably cost $3,000. And uh, Jared and I, Jared that works for me, we just sat there and we figured, well, we can do something, you know, it cost us $15 to make these sunflower pans that we have. and. They work fantastic. And we went through three, four different processes. We tried thinking it would work and it didn't. So again, I'm glad you know, that I was able to make those mistakes and find something that works so that other farmers can utilize that. 
So it's fairly inexpensive. After it's harvested and then drying it and not getting it too dry. I mean, one thing we can't do is get that oil seed too dry because if you get it too dry, then you have trouble extracting the oil out of it. There's aerators that are used to uh, remove the moisture out of the seed. So we have to have the moisture at optimum, uh, optimum level. The moisture level for, to get optimal oil extraction for canola is 8-9% moisture. Uh, we've had canola seed that was down to 4% moisture and it's almost virtually impossible to get the oil out. And for sunflowers, 10, 11, 12% moisture is ideal for sunflowers to get the maximum amount of oil out of them when you press the oil out. Something that a lot of people that aren't, aren't into farming, or even the ones that are and that have never grown a grain or an oil seed, is that that's something we need, is storage. You have to have something that's capable of drying and something that's capable, you know, something capable to store it all in. We've done a lot of different ways of storing this seed and there's, if you're a real small scale, there's, it's fairly simple. We've used one ton tote bags and put uh, oil seed in that. For under $20,000 you can get started and to put in a processor and everything and an oil press to press your oil and to make all your own fuel. So that to me was like, wow, you know, I mean, that's not very sexy. A million and a half dollar digester is sexy, but that's okay. We doesn't have to be sexy, <laughs> but it's economical and it works. What we, this is, we've got two oil presses. Uh, that's, a, that's a Chinese press. This is a European press. This whole thing has got to get hot for it to start getting the oil out, the, right, you know, the, the, the maximum amount of oil out. So as you're running it, the friction creates the heat. So by the time this gets heated up, we're gonna, it's gonna take 50 to 100 pounds of seed to go through it. Then it starts getting the maximum amount of oil. So there's limitations to it, but 2,900 versus 15,000. And once this gets going, you basically, you have to manually, you know, uh, keep the, the meal cleaned out. And uh, this, you get a lot more meal come out through these discs. So it piles up here and you have to manually clean that out. So there's more manual, labor involved. The other one, you put a one ton tote over top of it, it gravity feeds, takes 20 minutes, then you walk away and you come back tomorrow and it's all gone, it's all done. This one here, you have to have somebody manning it almost all the time. So that, that goes back to my $20,000 worth of investment to make all your fuel. I mean, you'd buy one of these. You can make all your fuel with that. And uh, you can buy a processor for processing the oil. This system here, because of research for research purposes, was 17,000. I could have put a system in for 3,500. That would make 150 gallons of fuel a day. When winter time comes, when we're done all harvesting all our other crops, uh, we have a little bit of lack time, then we'll uh, just start pressing. These are the heaters. You want to heat the press up to 120 degrees, roughly. It just warms up the oils inside and helps it flow through easier. In this system, what Jerry's doing right now is just that you want to get the oil start flowing. So he just puts pressure on with a screwdriver, uh, just or whatever you happen to have. And then then you'll clean it out. The oil started flowing a little bit. And then you'll put a nozzle in there, and you'll see once the nozzle's on uh, that the meal will come out uh, all confined, pressed into an uh, to a pellet type form. And, uh, you need back pressure to hold that seed in there long enough so that it squeezes the oil out and then just the meal comes out which is left after the oil has been extracted. So. The oil, you see that there's specks in it, but 24 hours basically that'll settle out. And uh, it'll look like that once it's settled out. That's without filtering it. So after we get done uh, pressing the oil seed, it's all uh, put into a container. Once a day, we'll take that container and we'll pump the oil into these uh, 250 gallon totes. And this is where it'll set for one to two months and it gives it sufficient time to settle out the, uh, the fines that we were looking at a minute ago. The oil is taken from here and 
it's pumped out of this. And it's pumped in to here. And this is our processor for processing the oil into biodiesel. We'll do what we call a titration test, which, which checks for the fatty acids in the oil. And it tells us how much sodium hydroxide or methanol we need to get a reaction to remove the glycerin out of it. And then once we know what each tote of oil, we'll know what the titration levels are. Then we'll just run it through the processor and make our biodiesel. If you don't have the recipe right for making biodiesel, you end up making soap. For 50 gallons of vegetable oil that's put in here, there's going to be about 10 gallons of glycerin, and that's, that's what's left over after you make the process uh, for biodiesel. The glycerin will just open this valve up, put a hose on here, and the glycerin will just put into a, a waste container. What's left is biodiesel. Then the biodiesel is pumped through the filters and then into a storage tank. After we've uh, made our uh, biodiesel, we put it in these containers here, then we bring it underneath uh, this shade area because we want to keep the fuel out of the direct sunlight because it keep it from breaking down means from getting rancid. So we don't want to run rancid fuel, so we keep it shaded at all times. Then we put this pump into these tanks, just a regular fuel pump. It can be used for either biodiesel or for diesel fuel. After six years of uh, doing the research work, trying to figure out what our costs are and adding, putting everything together and we've got some concrete numbers that it's costing us $1.70 a gallon to make biodiesel. It's a dollar a gallon cheaper than what we, we can buy our fuel for. We figure in a depreciation cost of the equipment over a period of time and we use the more expensive system to come up with $1.70 a gallon for production of biodiesel. So if I, had, if I had to put in a $3,500 system, then we would have depreciated that out over a period of time to come up with a fuel cost, and the fuel cost might have been even less than that. So that's pretty easy to figure that it's, it's profitable for us to do it. And on this farm here, I mean, we'll use about probably 5,000 gallons a year. Because we've got five diesel tractors, all those run on biodiesel. Everything that has a diesel engine in it runs on biodiesel. You take a vehicle that burns diesel fuel and we put biodiesel in it with no conversion or anything. Just instead of pumping diesel fuel, you're pumping biodiesel into your tank. Everybody I talk to that has tried to biodiesel says their engine runs better than they've ever seen them. Because biodiesel has a lot more lubricity, so it lubes the engine better. So it does a, you don't have that diesel knock that people normally hear in a diesel engine because it just runs so much smoother. So there's no question biodiesel is really good. The bad part is that people have gotten a bad taste with biodiesel is because people are trying to make biodiesel out of old used vegetable oil. A lot of times there'll be grit or something in that old oil that can get in and affect the fuel pumps and stuff. But running virgin vegetable oil when we're growing it here, we don't have that problem. I love it. It's just you're out in the field all day and smelling that old stinky diesel fuel. That biodiesel smells like french fries all day long. So you don't want to be hungry when you're out there driving tractor. It's just so much more pleasant working all day smelling french fries than it is smelling sulfur. Biodiesel is not uh, intended to use year round. That's one thing we have to realize. And that's why it works so good here in the Northeast. Because in the wintertime we use very little fuel because we're not cropping the fields. I mean, 90% of our fuel is used in the summer. Biodiesel gels when it gets to a certain degree. Uh, the 30, 35 degrees, you're pushing the limit on using biodiesel. So that's, that's the drawback. Self-sufficiency, there's a lot of gratitude in that. It's like eating your own vegetables out of your garden, you know, I mean, it's something you've done yourself and it, and I mean, it's, it's good for the environment. That's, you know, that's not the main thing for doing it. With farmers, it's always economics. I mean, everything's got to be economical. If it's not, you can't afford to do it. And it is economical, but there's a lot of satisfaction in knowing that, you know, it's just nice to, to be burning something in your vehicle that 
that you processed yourself? I mean, who would have thought, you know, 20 years ago, somebody asked me, how, how about you making your own fuel? Are you crazy? I, I'm not a big oil company, but it's something we can do. So there's, there's a lot of satisfaction in that. This video has been made possible with funding from Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education, SARE.